Hello, everyone. Today we are going to talk about uh, behaviorism and uh, imperfections. Until now, rationality uh, has been a very important uh, assumption in uh, all the theories that I have presented. So people, uh, firms, any agents uh, were supposed to take their decisions uh, following their best interests and acting consistently in a rational way. And um, markets, uh, the emphasis on, on the, the way they function was on the fact that they function well, they are efficient. In a sense, they are perfect. Uh, of course, economists have always known that uh, this is exaggerated, and, uh, and some uh, of them have insisted on uh, some irrational behavior of people, like Keynes, when uh, he was attributing the cause of uh, big recession to animal spirits, uh, the fact that, that uh, expectations about the future uh, are somehow uh, irrational or um, following a herd behavior. But uh, to a large extent, uh, the economic theory benchmark is centered around this idea of uh, rationality of agent and uh, the perfection of, of the markets and uh, um, the hope of uh, many uh, theorists uh, in the 50s when they, they brought uh, the, these uh, theories was that the imperfections, uh, the departure from uh, the, the, the ideal model uh, were not a great source of concern because uh, they were small and could be neglected. Thanks, can you close the door please? Um, and a wave of, um, of economists uh, in, starting in the 70s um, contested this view and showed that uh, in most of cases human, humans do not behave according to what was uh, understood as rationality and uh, that uh, markets uh, are often, if not always, uh, inefficient uh, because of uh, problems of information, essentially, uh, and other problems. But um, in the second part of the course, I will focus on the, the problems of information, um, because in, in the, the benchmark theory, uh, information is, is shared by everyone, and everyone knows uh, all that is uh, necessary to make decision. And if uh, you remove this assumption, you lose uh, many of the good properties of, uh, of the markets. Um, and in the first part of the class, I will uh, talk about departure from perfect rationality from uh, the, the way people behave. Um, so the, this line of, of research is called behaviorism or behavioral economics. economics. And uh, it is the idea that uh, we want to study uh, directly how people take decisions, behave, uh, to have a more realistic model uh, of society. I'll start with uh, Nobel Prize Maurice Allais who uh, was a very good uh, theorist. Um, he developed uh, two massive books, like 1,000 pages each, uh, in the 40s, uh, Traité d'économie pure and uh, Économie et, et intérêt. And, um, and these books uh, were preceded uh, many important ideas in economics that were uh, rediscovered only several years later uh, in the US. Uh, and the, these books um, went largely unnoticed outside the French because they were written in French. And so uh, Maurice Allais didn't have a very big influence uh, on uh, economics, 
although uh, he proposed uh, some original ideas years before uh, they were widely adopted, like the overlapping generation models, uh, where so it's it's a much better model to describe uh, uh, decisions uh, of, of agents, like uh, savings decisions, uh, where you have. Um, at each period, two generations that are living, the, the young and the old. The young, they, they work and uh, they, they consume and they save for retirement out of their wage. And uh, the old people, they live off, they don't work and they live off uh, their, their savings uh, when they were young. Uh, this is uh, much better, uh, it has more realistic conclusions than the, the representative agent model that lives indefinitely, uh, which is the the basic one. Uh, another example is the golden rule savings rate, uh, that the rate of interest should be equal to the rate of growth uh, to have the, uh, an, um, to maximize the intertemporal uh, consumption, uh, which uh, gave a Nobel Prize for Edmund Phelps, uh, who indeed uh, didn't discover it, or maybe discovered it independently uh, 15 years later. And, and these books contain many other, uh, uh, I mean, it developed uh, the, the, the equilibrium, general equilibrium theory uh, in a very rigorous way uh, and, uh, and, and with more depth uh, often than uh, that the, the, the papers and books that, um, are, that, uh, that are known by, by the profession. And uh, so the, the Nobel committees felt uh, obliged to, to honor uh, Maurice Allais by a Nobel Prize uh, quite late after uh, some other guys uh, also obtained a Nobel Prize for something that, uh, that they, they, they put up later that was already in his books. Uh, Maurice Allais still had uh, some influence on the economic debate uh, for his criticism of the rationality um, uh, of the, yeah, the, the, the axiomatization of the, the way people take decision, the, the expected utility uh, representation by von Neumann and Morgenstern, and in particular their independence axiom. Uh, you might have already heard of the Alès paradox. Um, this is uh, a, an example by, by Maurice Allais where people actually do not, uh, many people do not behave as the theory would suggest. So I'm going to, to make you uh, uh, vote uh, again on this uh, website uh, Slido. Uh, Okay, so the, the URL is um, this one, slide.do slash 8067white14. I'm going to paste it to Zoom. Um, so um, on the, the following um, thing. So look only at, at choice one for the moment. So say, uh, you are offered a choice between a lottery A that gives, it's not really a lottery, it gives you one million uh, francs for sure, or lottery B that gives you uh, one million francs with an 89% chance, five million francs with 10% chance, and with 1% chance you get zero. So what do you prefer between lottery A and lottery B? Let us check uh, the result. Uh, what do I prefer, actually? Uh, I think I prefer Lottery B. OK, so, um, so three fourths uh, prefer Lottery B. Uh, even more. Um, now, between, uh, yeah, OK, so yeah. I think it won't, uh, I mean, I think most people be behave rationally in this, in this classroom, in, in the sense of my mind more engaged term. Now, what do you prefer between lottery A prime and lottery B prime in choice two? So lottery A prime, you have 11% chances to win 1 million, and lottery B prime, you have 10% chance to win 5 million. Uh, 
Um, okay, sorry, I have to activate the, the thing. Uh, so you cannot vote yet. Yeah, now you can. So again, most people, uh, oh, no, it's not the, it's the same. Oh yeah, I'm the, okay, it's here. Okay, you can refresh. Hmm. What was the URL already? Yeah, lottery A prime or B prime. I think I would B prime again. Okay, everyone prefers B prime. So at least there are some some people that don't uh, respect the the Allais paradox uh, in the room. Um, because there are some people who uh, chose the um, lottery A, and uh, or maybe they also chose uh, A prime, but 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 there are more people who chose uh, A. So there must be some some of you who chose A, and um, and B prime. And uh, as I'll explain, uh, this violates the independence axiom. Just uh, for the record, when uh, this is uh, proposed to, to random people, uh, like about half, at least half of people uh, prefer uh, lottery A uh, than lottery B and prefer lottery B prime uh, to lottery A prime. So, so majority of people behave like violate the independence axiom. So what does this uh, axiom say? It says that uh, if you prefer uh, Los Angeles to Montreal, uh, then you will also prefer uh, going to Los Angeles with probability P than going to Montreal with probability P, given that uh, with probability one minus P, uh, you could go, let's say, to whatever, like uh, with any, any other destination, it wouldn't matter, you would prefer uh, the, the, <coughs> the package where you have a chance to, to go to Los Angeles. Um, now, try to forget about the, the first line the 89% line, and look only at the, the last two lines, then uh, you remark that it is the same between choice one and choice two. In both cases, uh, there is a, the A or A prime, you win one million for sure, and the B or B prime, there is 10 chance uh, out of 11 that you win five million. So this is um, exactly the, the independence uh, axiom with probability 11% uh, you get um, this lottery. So lottery A or I mean the, 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 the below part of, uh, of, uh, of A or A prime can be say uh, L here, Los Angeles, and the B or B prime part would be uh, Montreal. And, um, and it shouldn't matter uh, what happens in the 89% uh, of other cases. Another way to view it is that you have uh, a compound lottery with two stages. In the first stage, uh, with 11% chance, you get uh, this below lottery. Uh, and with 89% chance, uh, you get 1 million. Uh, and you don't have to make any choice then your choice at the second stage uh, should not depend on the, the first stage because it's already realized and uh, I mean, at least this is what the independence axiom says. So if we replace one million by zero in the first stage, it shouldn't uh, affect uh, what you decide to the second stage uh, if you know that you are within this 11%. Uh, but this is uh, often not how people um, think. Um, they violate the independence axiom or a, a related axiom, which is the uh, irrelevance of uh, the um, independence of irrelevant alternatives. Uh, basically, that uh, what happened to the f in the first stage is irrelevant to the decision uh, in the second stage. Um, many people prefer lottery A, where you win one million with certainty, uh, to lottery B, where there is a one percent chance not to win. 
and they prefer lottery B prime uh, where the price is 5 million to lottery A prime where the price is only 1 million with a small, uh, just a small decrease in the probabilities. Is there any question? Uh, it was, it's, it's funny because so in the, in the 50s, uh, Alès uh, organized a conference in, uh, in Paris where he invited uh, all famous economic theorists of the time and uh, he made them play the, just uh, as I did with you. And um, the, the theorist that had co come up with the, with the expected utility theory, uh, most of them violated the independence axiom uh, in their choices without even noticing. So it made a big impression on them when Ale uh, told them that they did not behave rationally. Um, now, um, now, after uh, Allais, uh, economists strived to, to find uh, an alternative model that would uh, explain uh, why people, how people could make decisions if it's not uh, with expected utility. And I'll come to that uh, in a minute. Before, I want to speak about Herbert Simon, which uh, is a very interesting thinker and uh, researcher who spanned a uh, lot of, of different disciplines. Um, he, he contributed to economics, psychology, management, uh, computer science, uh, and um, with a common question, which is, how do people reason? He, was, um, he became uh, famous with a, a book called Administrative Behavior, where he analyzes how do organizations make decisions. Um, and I quote, the human being striving for rationality and restricted within the limit of his knowledge has developed some working procedures that partially overcome these difficulties. These procedures consist in assuming that he can isolate from the rest of the world a closed system containing a limited number of variables and a limited range of consequences. So he explains that uh, people cannot optimize because they have limited cognitive capacities, they have limited information, they have limited knowledge, and they have uh, a constraint in time. Um, so they simplify the, the problem they face. They, they make, um, they try to, to separate problems into sub-problems and uh, to make assumptions of uh, what can be ignored when uh, addressing a problem because uh, it is likely not to have a big influence. Um, then uh, it goes on to uh, study how can organizations function given that the organization has a different goals than the individuals that compose it. For example, the goal of a firm may be to maximize profits, whereas the goal of its employees would be uh, to, to not uh, work too much and uh, to receive a high salary. Uh, he identifies two main um, uh, behaviors, uh, two main, um, not behaviors, uh, yeah, ways uh, with which the goals of individuals can be aligned with those of their organization is authority and loyalty. So authority is a set of, of rules, both formal and informal, uh, that um, force people to abide by the, the, the goal of their organization, uh, that expose them to sanction or, or again, uh, formal sanctions or, or informal ones uh, if, if they do not. And the second one is loyalty, where people um, would internalize the goal of their organization uh, by identifying themselves with the broader organization 
And uh, because of this uh, loyalty, they, they would feel good when the organization uh, does well and bad when it does bad. Um, yes, and I mean, th this book contains uh, many other ideas, uh, but, um, and, and is one of the most uh, cited book in, in management science. Um, Herbert Simon, um, studied uh, how people make complex decisions to understand how do people reason. For example, he studied um, how chess players choose their move, uh, like grandmasters, because they cannot uh, optimize, because uh, as we've seen in the game theory class, it's, uh, it would take an infinite amount of time and, uh, and resources, uh, or close to infinite, to, uh, to compute the, the optimal move. And uh, what Simon noticed is that, um, yeah, people behave uh, according to bounded rationality. So they put some bounds on the, uh, their optimization process uh, that are uh, due to constraints of uh, abilities, information, and time. Um, so it's probably a more realistic uh, depiction, depiction of rationality to present rationality as bounded. And um, the way the, the, the chess player does a move is that uh, they evaluate different possible moves and choose the, the, the move that, that seems the best among uh, the, the ones that they have uh, checked. And uh, in particular, they, they, they stop searching for a better move when they are satisfied with uh, a move they found. So contrary to optimizing, Simon depicts decision making as satisfying. This is uh, two, two words uh, make, making, made one. Uh, it's a merge between, uh, I mean, you, you satisfy when you uh, when your decision satisfies you and suffices. So it's enough and uh, it satisfies you. <clears throat> there are several ways. Um, yeah, so agents search through the, the uh, available alternatives until uh, they meet uh, some acceptable decision. When they, they, they find a choice that is uh, above their um, uh, aspirational level. There are several ways to model this. Oh yeah, an example first. So um, firms, uh, so Simon also studied uh, uh, like in a sociolo sociological way, like how do uh, firms uh, work? And uh, he observed that often they don't maximize profit, but they aim at earning a normal profit, uh, like the average profit uh, of firms. And um, when they, earn more than that, or they are at this normal profit, they, they stop doing efforts to, to, to earn a higher profit. Whereas the maximizing firm, according to economic theory, would, uh, would still continue to, 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 to look for ways to improve their profit uh, again and again. So, um, the um, <clears throat> implication of, of Simon's theory is that uh, firms that reach their normal profit, they will uh, be conservative, uh, accept the status quo, continue what they are going, what they are doing, and firms that are below this normal profit, they will try to change things in their uh, organization, in the way they are doing their business, until they meet this normal profit. This also leads him to the conclusion that um, firms would, uh, there cannot be a competitive equilibrium because um, if there is a free competition, then um, some firms uh, will earn uh, less than the normal profit and so we will try to change things so it will not be stable, it will not be an equilibrium. Uh, whereas if firms uh, collude, uh, to, to decide jointly to, to, not, to, to, to accept the normal profit and not try to outcompete the others, uh, then every firm is satisfied and uh, it's stable. 
So there are several ways to model uh, this. Uh, the first one is that um, the, the agent will find a choice, C, such that uh, the utility brought by C is above their aspirational level A. Second one, which is uh, the same uh, without a utility function, uh, is that uh, the agent will find a choice which is in the satisfying set, which is satisfying, just a utility with, with two levels, one and zero. Or you could model this as a full optimization, but an optimization that takes into account all costs, including the cost of acquiring information and the cost of optimizing itself. And uh, in all these um, ways of modeling it, a crucial task is to determine the aspirational level. Okay, because uh, how should the agents uh, choose their aspirational level in the first place? This is a complex question. Uh, Simon had some hypothesis uh, about this. One of which is through learning. So people will learn from uh, their past experience, from what they see in others, uh, whether a given level is satisfying or not. And uh, they will adapt uh, their aspirations through learning. Um, Yes, um, just to, to, yeah, this, this is connected to computer science in, in, uh, in two, two ways. Uh, the first is that um, in, in, there was a fundamental uh, result in mathematics and, and computer science in the 30s by uh, Kurt Gödel that uh, there are some things that cannot be computed. Uh, that cannot be known, basically. There are some limits to what uh, mathematics can prove. And to give you uh, an example, it's not a very good example, but uh, it's the best example I could find for the daily life, is, um, let's say, uh, right after the class, uh, you have to catch a train, but I finished the class a bit late, so you only have uh, three minutes to get to the train station and uh, you have uh, your bicycle and uh, you want to know what is the fastest way to go to uh, the train station. You can uh, ride your bike and, uh, and, and just go down the street where uh, your intuition uh, uh, brings you, or you can uh, open your, your phone and find for, uh, look for the, the fastest route. But the thing is, maybe the time you will gain from looking at your phone uh, will be lower, that, uh, will be more, uh, I mean, you, you will lose time by looking at your phone, uh, even though it can uh, give you um, a better, a faster route, faster route. This is because you cannot know in advance uh, the, the time you will gain by optimizing. Okay? Um, so optimizing, e is not, uh, I mean, cannot be understood in the, um, in the um, naive way where uh, the optimization process is outside uh, the real world and, uh, and it has no cost. And, uh, and there is a limit to uh, the, the, the way you can include the optimization cost in your optimization program. So uh, people have to use uh, shortcuts and, uh, and cannot uh, optimize completely. And the second way it is uh, related to uh, computer science uh, is, is learning, of course, because one of the, the big ambition of Simon was to develop an artificial intelligence. And this is why he studied how do people uh, reason uh, to reproduce it uh, in a machine. And actually, he coded the first artificial intelligence in the 50s. Um, and th the reason why he wanted an, an artificial intelligence is to do science. And uh, he succeeded because uh, this uh, program in the 50s proved um, mathematical theorems uh, by uh, Bertrand Russell and, and Whitehead, so in Principia Mathematica, so it's uh, like the, 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 f 
a book that, that, that axiomatizes uh, mathematics that were written in the beginning of the 20th century. So that the book, like after 200 pages, you have a proof that one plus one equals two. You know, so it really uh, starts from uh, the, the basics and, and uh, develops mathematics theory. And his program uh, was able to uh, demonstrate by itself the first theorems of the book and even uh, provided a simpler and more elegant proof than uh, what was known and what was in the book for one of the theorem. Uh, then he went on uh, by, by creating an artificial intelligence to, to rediscover by itself the, the, the basic laws of physics, like by giving it the, the way uh, planets move and, uh, and the, um, the program had to infer the Kep Kepler and Newton's law, etc. So Simon was a pioneer in many disciplines. Uh, until today, he's the most cited author in cognitive psychology and artificial intelligence. And uh, not only uh, did he win the Nobel Prize, but also uh, the Turing Prize for the, the best computer scientist and the, the prize for the best uh, psychologist, also in operation research. Um, Unfortunately, I think uh, his uh, bounded rationality theory didn't make it to the mainstream of economics. Although all economists would agree that, uh, that this makes sense, that this is more realistic than the models we currently have, uh, for, for some reason, maybe because uh, economists don't optimize what they are doing, we, we are still uh, stuck with um, the benchmark uh, rational uh, theory of expected utility. Uh, a theory that was more successful, actually, to, to move the discipline is prospect theory. And, um, and so this is uh, an alternative uh, theory uh, that to expected utility that is uh, used by, uh, by many economists. It's not the mainstream, but, uh, but it's, it's quite mainstream. I mean, uh, in, in many applications, uh, it is used. It was developed by uh, Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky, uh, both uh, psychologists, but uh, with a big, uh, I mean, they are also uh, economists de facto. Um, Tversky didn't win the Nobel Prize because he died uh, before, but uh, he, he wrote uh, all the papers jointly with uh, Kahneman. And um, so they, they did two things. Uh, first, they developed uh, behavioral economics, meaning that uh, they, they brought uh, people, so often students, uh, which is not the best representative sample, but uh, they, they brought people to the lab and uh, made uh, small experiments uh, with them, uh, such as what I've just done, like which lottery do you prefer, to observe um, the choices made by people um, and uh, these experiments showed that um, most people do not conform with the von neumann morgenstern uh, definition of rationality. And the second thing they did is provide a theory, prospect theory, to explain uh, these facts, uh, to, to rationalize them and, and put them into a model that um, aims at predicting how would people take decisions. Uh, here are some departures uh, from um, perfect rationality. The first one is the certainty effect. So this is the one uh, that we've seen with the Alice paradox. This is that uh, people prefer um, things that are certain, like uh, in the sense that it has a greater effect on their utility to reduce the probability of gaining 1 million from 100% to 99% than from 10% to 9%. The second one is the reflection effect. And, and here I also have uh, a small test. Um, so you can refresh uh, the page. It's... Uh, yeah. So, uh, do you prefer uh, to lose 1,000 francs for sure, or to lose 2,000 francs with 50% chance? So I throw a coin, and uh, if it's head, 
nothing happens. If it's stale, you lose 2,000 francs. What do you prefer? Yeah, for sure it depends. And actually, they, they talk about this in prospect theory. But you can answer as if like you are you. <laughs> so. What? No, like you. Like uh, don't know if you are rich or poor. Or, but, uh, <laughs> depends uh, on if you, if you can't uh, if you are myopic. If you, if you look at your student's income or if you think of your intertemporal income. But, uh, <laughs> Milton Friedman would say uh, you're probably rich because your intertemporal income, if you stay in Switzerland, uh, is quite high. But, uh, okay. Um, okay. I think I prefer um, I prefer to to play. And um, okay, most people are indifferent. Okay, half of people prefer to play, and, and no one prefers to lose one thousand francs for sure. Now, uh, let's do the, um, the alternative. So you replace the 4 by a 5 in the URL. 806715. Um, it's the, the same question, but um, in the positive uh, side. So do you prefer to win 1,000 francs for sure? Uh, it's uh, 806715. Um, do you prefer to win 1,000 francs for sure or to win 2,000 francs with 50% uh, chance? Okay, here it's mixed. Actually, okay, no, more, yeah, the majority of people uh, prefer the, the short choice. So you see, you do, you don't, we don't behave uh, symmetrically uh, in the gain and in the loss side. This cannot really be explained by um, classical um, expected utility theory because uh, in the benchmark model, Utility depends on uh, your consumption level, which is always positive. Something like this, okay? So, um, so your consumption, say we are, you are here, either uh, you lose uh, 1,000 for sure, so you are here, uh, or you lose 2,000 with um, one uh, half, so yeah, so this is, um, okay, this is the current income, C0, and uh, this is the utility you get if uh, you lose uh, 1,000 for sure. This is the utility you get if you lose 2,000, and, um, okay, I should put it, lower to, to, so that it's clearer. Let's say it's here when you lose um, 1,000 uh, for sure. And, uh, and 2,000 would be here. And so the expected utility uh, of losing uh, 2,000 with uh, a 50% chance, it will be one over half of utility uh, of uh, minus 2,000 plus one over one half utility uh, of the, the, your current income. So it is the mean point here. And you see it is below the utility uh, where you lose for sure. This is because the utility function is concave, and uh, this is called risk aversion. When your utility function is concave, risk aversion is exactly that, that you prefer um, uh, a sure uh, 
a sure loss or a sure gain than an unsure one with the same uh, expectation in terms of, of gain. Uh, because the expectation of uh, minus 2,000 or minus zero uh, with probability 50% is the same. You have the same effect uh, in, uh, in the gain than in the loss. Uh, you would prefer, uh, if you're risk averse, uh, a sure gain of 1,000 than uh, an unsure one. And so what uh, we have observed uh, is that we are risk averse when uh, it concerns the gains, but we are risk loving where the loss uh, is involved. Okay, because we preferred uh, to bet in this case than to have the sure loss. So um, Kahneman and Tversky said that, okay, so then it means that this point, uh, the current consumption, is special. This is our reference point. Uh, so we can put it at zero. And uh, there is a kink, uh, I mean, no, it's not a kink, sorry. And there is a convexity in the, on the left of this point. So we are risk loving on the left of this point. They call this the reflection effect. Um, now, a third effect is loss aversion. So again, a uh, quick poll will be the last one of the session. Uh, what do you prefer? Nothing or losing 900 franc with 50% chance and winning 1,000 francs with 50% chance. So I'll see if you like to go to the casino. Um, okay, so everyone prefers that nothing happens. Although in expected uh, terms, uh, we would win by the, the second option, okay? Uh, if, we, if we have the opportunity to, to repeat the second option many, many times, we are even sure to, to gain. Uh, so this is loss aversion. Uh, this means that uh, we are risk averse around zero, basically, that there is a kink in the utility function that you, you see on the right. Uh, that's, so the, the kink is, it's not very pronounced on this, uh, on, the, on the slides, but uh, it shows that, uh, so around the reference point, it, it's not like that, but it's like that, basically. An equivalent loss uh, is, is, has a much larger effect on your utility uh, than a gain of the, the same amount. Um, and uh, a last uh, important uh, departure they find, probably the most difficult to, to model, is uh, that framing matters, the framing effects. So depending on uh, the way the question is asked, depending on the, the context, depending on, on who asked the question, uh, the mood of the person, uh, the answer will vary, the, the choice will vary. Uh, for example, it has been shown that uh, judges uh, put um, lower sentences after lunch than in the morning. <laughs> uh, okay, so um, then they, they tried to come up with a theory that can explain all these facts. Uh, this is called prospect theory. And um, when people evaluate a choice, so what they call an option um, is, is a prospect in their uh, terminology. So when you, you have a choice, you, you have the, the, the different options. Each of these options is a prospect. It's a prospect because um, you, you, you have different probabilities about what can happen. So you, you kind of prospect uh, into what can happen. Okay, so the first phase is the editing phase. So you recode the prospect uh, as gain or loss from a reference point. 
So the first step is to uh, choose, perhaps unconsciously, your reference point. Uh, so perhaps it's your current income, your current wealth, uh, maybe the, the income of uh, your co-workers, uh, and you will evaluate everything uh, according to this reference point. Uh, the, the framing, uh, the, the way you reframe the, the problem also occurs during this, uh, this phase, but I did not, do not elaborate on this. The second one is the evaluation phase, where uh, you transform probabilities uh, into what they call decision weights. Um, and this is to account for the certainty effect, the Alice paradox. So for example, the yeah, here also I can uh, make a graph. Um, they, they showed that the way people uh, transform probabilities is uh, like this. So this is the true probability. This is the transform probability. 0, uh, 1, 1. And it is, um, I shouldn't make a mistake. So this is the, the 45 degree line. So if people were completely uh, von Neumann, Morgan, and rational, they would uh, uh, use the, the correct uh, utility. Uh, at 0 0.5, it's the same. And then, uh, then it's like that, basically. I mean, it's more, more like that, yeah. So basically, people would overweight the small probability and uh, would overweight negatively the high probabilities. Uh, this is people uh, because people are uncertain about probabilities and, um, and are not used to reason with the probabilities that are well known. So we're not equipped uh, for, for that, uh, and probably for good reasons, because in reality, there are very few probabilities that are uh, well known. So, so there is a whole literature on cautiousness uh, that explains why, uh, if you are cautious, uh, you would uh, transform the probabilities in such a way. And when you transform the probabilities in such a way, then you val violate the independence axiom, and, uh, and the, but you solve the Alice products. You can uh, explain uh, behaviors of people. Um, this, uh, this theory, uh, really uh, shook uh, the economic profession because um, their papers, I mean, there are they're, they're 79 uh, papers and also the 92, they are remarkable. Uh, they're, they're very uh, compelling. Uh, each, uh, each paragraph is quite important. And uh, they, they, they really show convincingly that their theory uh, does a better job than uh, the, the expected utility theory. The problem of this theory is that uh, it doesn't respect uh, the most basic axioms, uh, like uh, transitivity of preference, the fact that if you prefer A to B and B to C, then you prefer A to C. Uh, it doesn't respect uh, the independence axiom uh, and, um, and consistency, like uh, preference can change depending on the framing. Uh, so what they said is that uh, if people notice these inconsistencies, I mean, violation of transitivity is quite strong. I mean, it's quite a, a problem for, for any one who wants to make rational decisions. They, 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 they explain that uh, if people notice that uh, they violate uh, transitivities or some other uh, desirable uh, characteristics, they will correct and uh, they will reframe the problem in such a way uh, that to avoid these violations. But they argue that in many cases, uh, people make contradictory uh, choices. Um, and, uh, and this is uh, probably one reason why uh, their, their theory is not widely uh, accepted by the academic profession, because uh, the, it's, it's quite, uh, I mean, you need, you need a sub-theory to explain what is the reference point, where, how probabilities are transformed, etc. And you also, um, I mean, when you want to, to provide a recommendation to policymakers, uh, you, you don't want to have uh, contradictory uh, recommendations or things that violate uh, basic tenets of rationalities. 
Um, so actually, in their 92 version of uh, cumulative prospect theory, uh, they, they improve on prospect theory by, uh, by making it, uh, at the same time, um, more uh, realistic in the description of uh, how people behave and also more close to, uh, to rationality. Uh, like they, they said, uh, I, think, I think it doesn't violate uh, transitivity anymore. Uh, Daniel Kahneman also um, made um, also made interesting other interesting contributions, notably the peak end rule, which is more a contribution in uh, in psychology. But uh, it says the following thing: that for a given episode, like uh, like uh, think of your last holidays. Okay, what do you remember from your last holidays? What most people remember is the the peak of uh, the episode, so where the emotions were the most intense, and the end of the episode. Like, I don't know, you missed your train, uh, the, it was late, something like that, uh, on the way back. And uh, this has uh, implication. Uh, in an experiment, uh, Kahneman uh, asked uh, doctors, surgeons, to divide uh, people in two groups. In the control group, they would do the colonoscopy uh, normally, so it's a um, colonoscopy. It's, uh, at, at the time of uh, where he, he wrote the paper, it was done without anesthesia. And so it's quite painful. Like uh, they, they, they move things uh, in your, I don't know exactly where. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and then they ask in the treatment group to the doctors, at the end, just, just stay uh, where you are, uh, let your finger there, and uh, just don't move for one minute. So it's still painful, but much less painful than, than the, the peak. And uh, they noticed that uh, what people remembered uh, was uh, less painful in the treatment group. Although, objectively, they, they suffered more because it, it, it lasted longer. And uh, so there is a discrepancy between the experiencing self and the remembering self. And uh, this has consequences because uh, those who were in the treatment group uh, were more willing to, uh, to go back to, for a follow-up uh, colonoscopy a few weeks later, and uh, so it was good for their health. Uh, so this is... Um, uh, yeah, somehow uh, departure from uh, from rationality, where we are fooled by our perception, our memory, uh, into into thinking we are uh, having more pleasure, although we just remember that we had more pleasure or less pain. Uh, Kahneman uh, was interested in what causes happiness or life satisfaction, and. Um, in a research agenda that uh, I find very interesting, uh, he proposed to, to build national well-being accounts uh, instead of uh, GDP that measures market activity. The idea would be to measure the pleasure, or it's more, it's more general that pleasure, he calls it positive affect. It's all the positive emotions that people have, uh, positive experiences. So uh, the way it would go is the following. You survey uh, a representative sample of the population, and you ask them to note every day uh, what time they spent on each activity, and uh, what were the emotions associated with it. And, uh, and then they, they, they classify the emotions in, in uh, like the good emotions, the bad emotions, or, or you ask directly the people like to grade from zero to 10 how, how good overall it was. Um, and um, aggregating all the responses, we are able to uh, attach uh, a certain emotional uh, level or positive affect to each kind of activity. And then uh, you integrate this over the time spent on each activity to obtain the experienced uh, utility or uh, well-being or uh, pleasure um, that people have experienced. And so if we notice uh, through these surveys that uh, some activities uh, bring more pleasure and some uh, more uh, discomfort, then uh, we can try 
individually and uh, as a society to uh, spend less time on activities uh, uh, that are uh, boring, painful, and more time in those uh, pleasurable activities. Um, so in um, so what do you think? Uh, so he, he did that with, with some co-authors. Uh, so the sample they used uh, is, is not great. It's only uh, in the US, uh, only female, only nurses. Uh, but uh, I haven't checked. Maybe there is uh, more literature uh, now uh, with, with better data. But uh, what do you think are the, the activities uh, that uh, they found are the most pleasurable? You can, the next question will be the least uh, pleasurable. <laughs> so what do you think, like, uh, what activities do people prefer? To eat. To eat? Yeah. Activities where they make a lot of like, decisions on their own, let's say people decide, oh, I just go for a walk outside, or I so, eat, what could I So do? decisions, it's funny because I hate to take decisions. For me, it would be down the list, but okay. Decisions. Uh, or free, freedom to make this happen. Freedom, okay, having, yeah, fr freedom. Okay, and what would people uh, hate to do? Study. What? What did you say? Huh? To study. To study, yeah. It's, uh, it's one of the, I mean, work, because that's study, but uh, it was the second to last. Uh, even worse uh, than work. So work comes second to last, and, so, and the last is uh, the morning commute. And, uh, and the preferred activity... The yeah, it's the order. Here you can see the net, net positive effect. Uh, I think it's from zero to five, something like that. The, the time spent, percentage of the sample that... Uh, so what people prefer is, uh, is uh, making love, or intimate relation, as they call it. Uh, and uh, although they, they only spend 12 minutes per day, so, uh, so yeah. Why? I don't know. <laughs> if, if the white people work so much and, uh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and then socializing after work, dinner, uh, relaxing. Also, taking care of the children is uh, not so pleasurable, apparently. <laughs> so... So again, these data are not so great, but I'm very curious to, to know uh, what, uh, what is the, true with the, the truth with a, a better sample. Um, all right. Uh, now let's talk about uh, nudges. So uh, Richard Taylor got the Nobel Prize recently um, for his... Um, emphasis on uh, the showing that factors that are supposedly irrelevant actually matter. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, he explains uh, in his uh, Nobel lecture uh, how he came up into, into this uh, line of thinking. So uh, he was with, uh, with, with friends uh, before dinner and uh, it was, there were peanuts and, uh, and people were complaining that uh, they cannot uh, resist but eating the peanuts and they won't have any appetite for the dinner, which is uh, better food than peanuts. And um, everyone was happy when he suggested to, to put the peanuts away. And um, this shouldn't matter to uh, the decision of people to, to eat peanuts or not, uh, because they can still go to the kitchen, eat the peanuts, uh, also, like uh, depending on where the, the peanuts uh, are, if it's close to you on the table or far from you, you will eat uh, more peanuts and, and be less happy, uh, which shouldn't matter. Um, so this is due to a lack of self-control. And this is the first supposedly irrelevant factor. A more interesting one is the endowment effect, uh, which is very close to the status quo bias or the loss aversion. And, uh, and this uh, endowment effect says that the willingness to pay is below the willingness to accept. So these, these notions, willingness to pay, willingness to accept, are uh, important notions in cost-benefit analysis, uh, when economists um, compute uh, the, the, what, uh, what decisions should be taken in the, 
uh, in uh, in things that are not marketable, like uh, like how much should we spend uh, to preserve ecosystem, uh, to uh, I don't know avoid um, accidents uh, on. Uh, uh, when, when you when you when you build something, uh, all these kind of, of things that uh, that do not have a price. Uh, so the, the first study of, of Taylor actually um, showed that uh, like asked people. I mean, I don't think I don't know if he asked people or yeah probably asked. But but then there is also some papers that do it uh, by observing choices of people, like how how much they invest in uh, in helmets or like other things that uh, decrease their risk of uh, dying. Uh, he showed that your willingness to pay to avoid uh, a risk of sudden death of 0.1% uh, is much lower than uh, your willingness to accept for such a risk. So if uh, I ask you um, how much are you uh, willing to pay so that uh, I reduce your probability of uh, dying suddenly by 0.1%, you will maybe, maybe ten, tell me, uh, okay, 5,000 francs. And uh, if I ask you, uh, how much are you ready to accept so that uh, I do something that increase your probability uh, um, of dying by 0.1%, uh, did, I, did I say it right? Like how much, uh, how much, no, 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 sorry, I didn't say it right. How much would you willing to, to accept that I pay you? Uh, yeah, that's what I said. Yeah, that's what I said. Yeah, that's, no. Um, yeah, yeah, to pay you so that uh, your, your probability increased by 0.1%, you will say much more, like uh, 1 million. Uh, so uh, Kahneman, Tyler, and Knetsch uh, showed this uh, in an experiment famous experiment where they gave uh, mugs, so like to drink tea, to uh, subjects, but only to half of them in a room. And they allowed them to trade. So uh, each uh, subject with a mug was asked uh, how much they are willing uh, to accept uh, to sell the mug. So the, the, the minimum uh, price they would, uh, they would accept to sell it. And those who hadn't received the mug were asked uh, how much, uh, at, at least, um, at most, they would be willing to pay for the mug of someone else. And here, they found that the willingness to pay was below the willingness to accept. Um, the thing is that there is uh, another explanation in this case than just uh, loss, aver loss aversion. Uh, it is that uh, it's, it can be a bargaining strategy. Like people are unsure of, their, uh, of the value they attach to the mug, and so they, they try to bargain such that uh, they, they make a little profit. Um, but their goal was not uh, really to, to prove uh, loss aversion, but to disprove the cause theorem. So unfortunately, I haven't talked about uh, Ronald Coase. He's another uh, Nobel Prize. And uh, his most famous contribution uh, says that it doesn't matter how, it doesn't matter for economic efficiency how the um, endowments are, uh, are split, uh, so how the property rights are defined. Um, you will obtain the, the same uh, efficient uh, outcome in any case uh, if there is no transaction cost. So the example he gives is uh, a plant uh, that, that pollutes and uh, that disturbs uh, the, the, the people that live near the plant. Um, okay, so uh, there is uh, two possibilities. Either um, the um, people uh, that are disturbed uh, pay the plant to uh, do some uh, retrofit, some to, to, to clean up the, the, the pollution, to avoid the pollution. Uh, or the, the plant uh, um, 
uh, yeah, maybe it's not the best example that I chose um, because uh, all the, the all the plants can can uh, can pay the yeah it's a, uh, mm -hmm. the sheep. Uh, let's say. Um, um, yeah, all the plants can uh, can can pay basically the people to um, to compensate them uh, against the the pollution, and um, so in what case in uh, yeah. No, sorry, I will think about this at the post to give you the, the, the better example. Uh, the, the, the bottom line of the, of the cause uh, theorem uh, is that uh, it doesn't matter uh, who owns the plant, basically, uh, if uh, it is better for society that the plant uh, does not pollute, it will not pollute. If it's better that it pollutes, then it will pollute. Uh, in, in the end, we'll compare the cost of incurring the pollution for uh, the, the people who live nearby uh, to the cost of uh, avoiding the pollution for the, price, for the firm, for the plant, and the, the option that will be chosen in the end will be the least costly option. And uh, what will differ uh, when we change the property rights, so who owns the right to emit, uh, is it the, the, the firm that has the, the right to emit, or is it the, the local people who have the, the right uh, to, to emit, basically, and, uh, and they, 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 they need to sell it to, to the firm, so the firm has to, to, to buy the, its right to emit. It doesn't matter for the outcome in terms of whether there will be pollution or not. It matters in terms of redistribution, because if the firms own the right to emit, then it wins, and the people who live nearby just lose, incur the pollution. If it's the people who live nearby, uh, they can be compensated, and the firm loses money. Um, and uh, actually, the, the cause theorem was um, uh, misinterpreted as the fact that uh, when you want to um, tackle a problem of externality to solve a pollution problem, it doesn't matter who you give the right to emit to, it will lead to the same uh, um, outcome, uh, at least if you forget about distributional issues. Uh, it's a misinterpretation because what Coase wanted to say is that this is only valid when there is no transaction cost, where it's not costly for uh, the, f the firm to settle the issue between the people nearby. But, uh, but it will cause a lot of time and money in, uh, in lawyers, suits, etc. Uh, so, so indeed, uh, this assumption is also always too strong. And uh, what uh, Taylor shows is that um, there is another way in which uh, this theorem, um, I mean, there is a way in which the theorem doesn't hold, even without transaction cost, is that the willingness to pay is below the willingness to accept. So, uh, depending on who is given the, the right to emit, uh, it will not, they will not be exchanged at the same price. Uh, okay? And so, it will not lead to the same outcome. If uh, the, the local people obtain the right to emit, uh, they will, uh, ac their willingness to accept will be higher, so they will ask a higher price to the firm uh, for the firm to, to, to pollute. If the firm has the right to emit in the first place, the, um, they, they, their willingness um, uh, to pay, uh, the willingness to pay of the, of the local uh, people to buy the right to emit, uh, to force the firm to uh, avoid the pollution, would be lower. And so, it can change the outcome. So, the example that uh, that uh, with which Taylor had this idea is uh, his, super, his PhD supervisor uh, was a fine of, of wine. And he said to Taylor once, uh, I never buy wine that costs more than $30. It's uh, one principle I have. And, uh, and look, there is this, uh, this bottle. I bought it 20 years ago uh, for $5. Now it's worth $100. And I would be delighted to, to drink it. Uh, and of course, I'm drinking it, not selling it. Uh, it's another example that, uh, of the endowment effect, 
whether you, you, you own the thing physically or not, uh, um, changes the value you attach to it. Okay, another uh, departure from uh, perfect uh, uh, homo economicus, as we say, um, is uh, the sunk cost fallacy. Uh, this is due to the, how people uh, think of, uh, of money. Uh, there is a theory of mental accounting. Um, here, the example that he gives is that uh, with a friend, they received uh, tickets for a baseball game for free. Uh, and they live, uh, you know, uh, in, I don't know, Chicago or in the Michigan, I mean, a cold place. So they were, there was Blizzard, the, 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 the day of the game. And uh, they, they were too lazy to, to, to drive for two hours in the blizzard. Uh, but his friend said, uh, you know, if we had paid for the tickets, we would have gone. Which is a sunk cost fallacy because uh, it's just like the two-stage uh, view of the Alice paradox that I explained. What occurred in the first stage, whether you paid the tickets or not, shouldn't have any influence on the decision you are taking uh, right now. Uh, this sunk cost fallacy uh, often occurs in, in big projects. You know, you decide to, uh, to build um, uh, nuclear power plants and then uh, at the middle uh, of, of building it, you realize it will be five times more expensive than you thought. And, and if you redo the compilation, then uh, it's not profitable anymore. But uh, people would still build, build it until the end because they would feel that uh, it would be uh, a waste to not build it. It's a, it's a fallacy because if you do the computation, you realize that uh, abandoning the project uh, would be more profitable than that, uh, doing it. Um, and uh, the um, conclusion, uh, the policy recommendation of, of all this is to nudge people. Nudging people uh, is orientating their choice uh, by proposing um, a choice architecture that is designed uh, to people making the better choice. So Taylor talks about paternalistic libertarianism because people are still free to choose whatever they want, but uh, the default option, uh, what most people will choose in the end, uh, will be uh, better, uh, arguably. A good example is uh, the donation of organs at death. If the default option is that your organs can be donated when you die, uh, and you can uh, fill up a form to say, no, I don't want, uh, then most people will donate their organs. But if it's a country, by default, uh, it cannot be donated, and you have to fill up a form when you are still living to say that uh, you want your organs to be donated, then uh, most people will not donate their organs. Um, Another uh, example is in, in urinals. When, when you put uh, a fake fly as a drawing in the urinal, it's much cleaner in the end of the body. And uh, something uh, with uh, more, um, of, uh, more importance is uh, retirement uh, savings. So uh, what Taylor did Okay, there are two, two experiments. In, in, the, in the simple one, they, they, because in the US, you know, uh, people can choose uh, their savings plan. There is no public uh, savings. So each company offers to their employees a savings plans, and each employee decides how much they would save. And uh, arguably, many people don't save enough. Most people don't save enough for retirement. Uh, so, um, the first, in the first experiment, uh, they just um, said to the company, you know, change the default option when, uh, when you hire someone, they have to, to fill up forms, and uh, instead of having the, the, the default option at 5% uh, saving, put it 20% savings. Turns out that 80% uh, of people uh, did not change uh, the, de the, the, the default option and ended up saving more. In the second experiment, um, they, they proposed to uh, a treatment group within a, a big firm uh, to uh, participate in uh, a voluntary program 
and uh, so many people participated. And in this program, people uh, committed, I mean, it's, it's just a promise, they, they, they were not legally committed, uh, but they, they committed um, to uh, increase their saving when they receive a pay increase. So instead of having a higher wage, they would put uh, part of all of this uh, increase in wage in, into, uh, into savings. Uh, well, people uh, who are in the control group uh, and, and could, um, yeah, ended up uh, doubling their savings uh, a few years later. Even though people in the control group could have also uh, participated in the, in, the, in the thing. They could have done this, this, uh, this thing by themselves. They were uh, aware that, uh, that uh, their colleagues were proposed this, and uh, they, they could have, have made uh, the, the same decision. Uh, but, uh, but this little nudge to, to just, um, uh, I don't know, make people sign something that uh, they, they would do it, uh, even though it's pretty voluntary, it had a big, big effect. Okay, unless there is some question, I will uh, make the pause now. So in the first part, uh, we've seen departures from uh, rationality, perfect rationality. Here, uh, we'll see departure from perfect information. The fact that uh, everyone knows uh, the relevant information. Because uh, in the 70s, as I said, economists started to relax this assumption and uh, into what we call asymmetric information, where different people hold different private information. I say private because, uh, because uh, they do not share it uh, necessarily. And, um, and this turned out uh, to, to destroy uh, a lot of uh, the, the results uh, of uh, general equilibrium theory, uh, such that uh, markets are efficient, uh, you know, the fundamental theorem of welfare, like uh, competitive equilibrium will be Pareto optimal, uh, or even um, that markets clear, uh, that supply equal uh, demand. So, um, Michael Spence, so, um, yeah, there are three uh, Nobles uh, in 2001 who were awarded uh, for this uh, endeavor. Michael Spence is the first one and proposed a theory of signaling. Signaling is a process uh, through which the one who has the information, if you recall the last class on mechanism design is the agent, uh, will credibly conveys this information about itself to the principal. Because in some cases, they will want to, to convey the information, but uh, the principal uh, would, be, would have some uh, lack of trust, and, um, and we need some mechanism uh, that the principal can trust the signal given by the agent, or can trust the information given by the agent, and this is done through a signal. The producing the signal is costly, and this is what uh, brings credibility uh, to this information. In particular, because uh, more productive types or higher types, again, if you remember last session, the type is like the, the information that, uh, that the agent has. It's uh, the characteristic of the agent, and one of the characteristics possible is like their productivity level. And so for more productivity, more productive people, uh, producing uh, certain signals uh, can be easier than for low productive people, which uh, would um, convince the principal that uh, if they receive the signal, it was sent by some uh, high productive guy. So why do you study, actually? Uh, there are, I mean, the obvious reason is to, to learn things, to, to gain knowledge. But there is a, another potential reason uh, that Spence um, 
proposed is to signal to uh, potential employers that you are productive. The idea is that um, acquiring a diploma requires time and effort, so it is more difficult for less productive or more lazy people. So more productive people are more likely to graduate. And in turn, graduated people are more likely to be productive. So firms are willing to pay graduated people more because they, in expectation, they are more productive. And productive people are willing to get a diploma to benefit from the higher wage, even if the diploma didn't bring any interesting uh, knowledge or skill or pleasure. Um, and so depending on the parameters of the model, there can be different, uh, there can be multiple equilibria, uh, including uh, a pooling equilibrium where everyone sends the same, the same signal, uh, no diploma, for example, if, uh, if uh, the, the, the cost of obtaining a diploma is too high for everyone, or uh, doesn't, uh, is, is roughly the, 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 or too low for everyone, uh, but, but still positive cost, uh, then if there is not enough variation in the, the cost between uh, more productive and less productive people, uh, there is no reason to, to gain a diploma, at least for signaling reason. There can also be separating equilibria uh, in which high productive to high type, highly productive people will uh, educate themselves, obtain a, a diploma, uh, and uh, low productive people not. And uh, we call it separating because uh, it separates the population in two groups. Uh, depend like above and below some pro productivity threshold and uh, this separating equilibrium conveys some information to uh, the firms that are hiring. Okay, is there any question? I need to close the door. Now, um, try to cover Akerlof um, and adverse selection in the last five minutes. The really well-known uh, paper by Akerlof is the market for lemons. In American slang, a lemon uh, designates a, a used car of low quality. And so, suppose that buyers of used car cannot distinguish a high quality car, so Americans call it a peach, from a lemon. This is because uh, the, some, some important characteristics of the car are hidden in the motor and, uh, and you need to, to, to be uh, an expert basically to, to see them or to have uh, driven the car yourself. You know how used it is, uh, what uh, pieces have been replaced and which not. So um, suppose the, the buyers do not know uh, if the car is a, a peach or a lemon, but at least they know the proportion of, of each type. The seller, they know uh, if their car is of good or bad quality. The buyers are only willing to pay the value of the average used car. Okay, they, they take, we, we forget about risk aversion here. Uh, to simplify, I go to straight to the point. So they know there is, for example, 50% of lemon that are uh, of value zero, and 50% of peaches that are of value 1,000. So they are ready to pay 500 for a car, and maybe they will have a good surprise, it's value 1,000 maybe a bad surprise, value zero. So they are, they're willing to pay five, 500. The thing is that sellers of pitches do not want to sell their cars at this price because the cars is worth 1,000, they can still drive it. So they will um, not engage in the market. They will not participate in the market and only the lemons will remain. But if the value of the lemons is zero, 
then uh, they will not be sold. Uh, I mean, if, if it's higher than zero, then, uh, then they will be sold, but uh, the, the average, there will be only lemons in the used car market. Uh, if, if their value is zero, which is the extreme case that he takes in the article, the market shuts down completely. Um, but uh, in any case, the pitches uh, are not put in the market. This is uh, a big inefficiency because there are buyers and there are sellers willing to trade uh, the pitches at their actual value. So because of asymmetries of information, uh, this exchange cannot occur. I quote, the cost of dishonesty, therefore, lies not only in the amount by which the purchaser is cheated, the cost also must include the loss incurred from driving legitimate business out of existence. So here the legitimate business is uh, selling uh, or buying used cars, and dishonesty is when you hide that your car is a lemon. This implies an externality. Uh, not only on, on the, it's not only you fool the, the one uh, to whom you uh, sell the car, but it's an externality for, for everyone because uh, the markets do not exist anymore. This uh, is called adverse selection because only uh, the bad product are selected in the. Um, are selected here in the market. So it, it has many uh, applications, so insurance, uh, lack of credit markets in low-income countries. I'll go back to that, come back to that uh, in the last lecture, actually in the next slide, but. There are some solutions to avoid these uh, adverse selection issues. And uh, all amounts to having uh, car dealers for used cars instead of just uh, a decentralized uh, market. Because if you have car dealers, then they can have a reputation and they, they don't want to, to sell lemons uh, because uh, they would lose their reputation, they would lose their business. Of course, the car dealer are experts in cars and they can control the quality and then they can certify the quality of the car. Uh, they can also be subject to regulation. Actually, there is a law in the US uh, that is uh, known as the Lemon Buyback Law that uh, says that car dealers uh, should uh, explicitly uh, say to the customers that they are ready to uh, buy back the car if uh, it turns out to, to be a lemon, uh, to be deficient. Now, uh, just a few words on uh, other works by uh, George Akerlof. He launched the field of economics and identity, uh, bringing insights from sociology into economics, showing that uh, norms are very important uh, in, in, uh, in why people uh, do what they do. And the way to model that is that norms uh, prescribe actions depending on an assigned or chosen identity. And uh, because uh, the norm prescribes some actions, I mean, the, or the, the way it prescribes some actions, uh, you can model it by altering, altering the payoff uh, of different actions depending on the group uh, you are assigned, depending on their identity. I quote, people behave in ways that would be considered maladaptive or even self-destructive by those with other identities. The reason for this behavior may be to bolster a sense of self or to solve a diminished self-image. Uh, an example uh, is like, uh, it's a very hot uh, summer and uh, you're a man, uh, you will wear a jean instead of a skirt despite uh, the heat. And this is to preserve your masculinity. This is because of the, the norm of masculinity, which will make you in, incur a, a higher cost if, if you choose the, the, the skirt, uh, than just um, uh, enduring the heat. Uh, so of course you can uh, change your identity and, uh, and, and find a social group that would accept that you wear a skirt. 
but but then uh, it's another identity. It also comes with the cost, maybe uh, from being uh, from, uh, <coughs> away from the the mainstream uh, identity. Uh, I mean, he applied uh, this to more important problem, that of uh, uh, discrimination and uh, and the identity of African Americans. But uh, I think I don't have time to to cover this because it's time. Thank you.